Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to show you how to get started with your first project, which is writing Connect 4 in C. And a big part of getting started with this project is learning how to interact with GitHub Classroom. So I'll be sure to demonstrate some of the key points of that as we go along. Now, before we get started, I'm going to assume that you have a GitHub account and that you've set up a public-private key pair and uploaded that into GitHub so you can easily clone and push and pull to private repositories. A small part of what I'm going to highlight in the video is also going to use Ruby. So I'm kind of assuming that you're working on a machine with Ruby installed. And if you don't want to take the time to install it on your own machine, you can always just do those steps on EOS. So let me begin by demonstrating what this project should look like when you're done. The big picture is that you're writing a text-based Connect 4 game. My goal when designing this project was to have as few requirements as possible on the user interface while still allowing for the use of automated tests. So the first rule is that the columns have to be labeled by letter. And your input is simply the letter you want to drop a token in. So if I type C, I get a token for player 1 in column C. If I type D, then a token for player 2, and then a token for player 1, and a token for player 2, and so on. So I can finish out the game. And if I drop that fourth token in the D column for player 2, the last line tells me that player 2 wins. The requirements for this last line are also very specific because the automated tester looks at the last line to see that the game played out correctly. The particular look of the board is completely up to you as long as using a single letter puts a token in the column. Now, if there's invalid input, so like if I do F and G and then H, which there is no column H, the game will just ask for the input to be repeated. I'm not checking the specific message. The important thing is the next thing I put in is just another column. And finally, if you enter Q for a column, that will quit the game immediately. The last line should simply say goodbye. Don't ask the user to confirm or anything, just simply quit. All right, so to quickly reiterate, the important things to remember are that your input is simply a single letter identifying the column and that the last line of the program is important because the auto tester is going to look at that to see that the game progressed correctly. So both the single word goodbye and the congratulations message have to be pretty exact. Okay, so now let's see how to get started with the project. So the starting point for the vast majority of assignments in this course will be the course webpage. And on that webpage, you'll find a list of assignments. You'll also see a list of assignments on the timeline link up here in the upper left. And then when you click on the link for the assignment, you'll come to the assignment right up. Your next step is to use GitHub Classroom to create a repo that will be pre-populated with the starter code. So if you follow this link, if you're not logged into GitHub, the first thing it'll do is ask you to log into GitHub. And then if you haven't used GitHub Classroom before, GitHub is going to ask your permission to interact with that separate application. So you just click on the green Authorize button down here. You will eventually get to a screen that asks you to create a new team because this first project is done in Teams. Now, when you're working with an assignment that allows Teams, every group needs a team name, even if you're working by yourself. And by the way, I strongly discourage you from working by yourself on this assignment. It's challenging and there's a lot of little things to do. So that could very well end up being a ridiculous amount of work for one person. Okay, any case, we need to pick a team name and I will go with C4 Demo Team. So I create that team. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a new repository for the team. And then it's going to copy the starter code from my template repository into the newly created repository. Now, when this repository is created, it is owned by my organization. And for this semester, it's called GVSU CIS2. That's what automatically gives me access to it. So I can examine your code if you have questions or I have access to it for grading and stuff like that. All right, so I'll click accept the assignment and it's now doing all that copying and stuff in the background. It takes a few seconds. Sometimes it takes a minute, but it should be done by now. I will refresh the page and what you'll have is you'll have a link to that newly created repo. Now you'll see here that the name of that repo is the name of the assignment, which is C4C, followed by the name of the team. So I can follow that link and there is the GitHub page for your assignment. Notice that it's not owned by your account, 
but by this organization GVSU CIS2. Now that you have this created, we can go over to the code and copy the URL for cloning. I'm using the SSH URL because I don't want to be putting a password in every time I interact with GitHub. And now I can go over to my terminal and do a git clone. And there's my starter code. For the past few years, I've been working primarily in Visual Studio Code as my IDE. You're, of course, welcome to use any IDE you like, or even no IDE if you like Emacs or Vim in the command line. But I'm going to tend to do most of my demos in VS Code. So we just have to open the folder. And let me give you a quick tour of what you have to get started. Here at the top, we have that .github directory. That is all stuff for the auto tester. Don't mess with it. The main thing to look at is the source directory. Now I've put some shell code in here. So for example, the C4 file is just where the main goes and I just have it do something. Now for the most part, the only thing that's going to be in this C4 file is the main function. It's important that the main function be in a separate file from anything you might want to unit test. In C, any given executable can only have one main function and your unit test framework will provide its own main. So your unit test executable can't have both the framework's main function and connect4's main function built in at the same time. So the common way to handle that is to put main in a file by itself and then put the other functions you need in various other files. Now, given the size of this program, it's probably reasonable to put everything else in a single other C file. I called that connect4 engine. And again, just to have something to start with, I threw in the start of an X in a row implementation. Notice it's nowhere near complete. You're welcome to use this as a starting point or you're welcome to completely redesign your X in a row function. Likewise with the header file, I have the prototype for that X in a row. Again, you may decide to use it. You may not decide to use it. It's only here so that the starter code will compile. The test folder is where the unit tests go. So I've set up the demo using a test framework called Unity. I picked Unity because one of our alums is one of the primary authors on that. You're certainly welcome to pick whatever unit test framework you like. Now my automated tests are primarily going to be what are called system tests. They're going to test your entire program as a system by running the entire program and making sure it generates the correct output. In contrast, unit tests only test one unit. And in the case of C, that single unit is typically a function. I'm leaning on system tests for the automated tests because I want to give you as much flexibility as possible to design this program the way you want to. And in order for me to write unit tests that your code would pass, you would then have to choose the same function names and function parameters that I did. And I thought that would be frustratingly constraining at this level. So the system tests are up here in the spec folder because I'm using a framework called RSpec. It's a Ruby framework. And the reason I'm using a Ruby framework is because then it's easy to use some regular expressions to parse the output of your program. Inside the spec directory will be some sample tests that you can copy from. Actually, let me bump up the font here a little bit. So this format will look a little bit strange if you've never used Ruby or never used a domain specific language before. Hopefully this is something we'll get to talk about a little bit toward the end of the semester. There's some neat stuff going on here. But for purposes of this first project, really the only things you need to know are that there is a method called test C4 and what you give it is the sequence of columns that you're dropping your tokens into. This is just all squished together, the keystrokes that you're going to type into your program to make it work. And then the next line just checks to see that the final state of your program is what we expect. So in the case of this first test here, dropping tokens in column A and A and B and B and C and C and so on should produce a win for player one. So we're looking to see that there's a win for player one. Down here, the input ends with a Q, and at this point there shouldn't have been a winner, so we should see that the program was abandoned. Down here are two similar tests, except we specify the parameters of the game explicitly. So this is a three by nine board, and you need to have seven tokens in a row to win. Up here without those parameters is the default for the game. So a six by seven board that is truly connect four. You need four to win. 
So with these four examples here, you should be able to add your own system tests without too much trouble. The spec helper method down here is what makes the Connect4 specific stuff work. It's where I've implemented test C4, and it's where I've implemented these matchers here. That either the correct player won, or that there's that goodbye message or whatnot. I've provided the Unity framework for you, so you don't have to download it and set it up yourself. There is the make file. So if you've used the file names that I've used, the make file should just work. If you decide to organize your project a little bit differently, you may have to make some changes to the make file. The readme is the source for the project instructions. And then the run C4 here is just a little bit of shell script magic that helps the RSpec test call your program correctly. All right, so what would your workflow look like? Well, the first thing you should do is write some more tests. This is the idea of test-driven development. And what you want to do is before you even start writing code, you want to have a good idea of how you're going to know if that code works or not. So by thinking through all the cases you'll need to test, it'll help you code things correctly the first time. The other main benefit of test-driven development is that if you write the test first, then you're not cramming them in at the end. And when they get crammed in at the end, they're often crappy tests. They're incomplete because you don't have a lot of time to write them. And the other thing that tends to happen if you write your tests at the end is you write your tests so that your code passes. Then it's not really testing your code. Here, let me say that a little bit different. If you write your code first and you've made a mistake when you write your code, that mistake that's in your head from writing your code that you haven't recognized as a mistake yet will influence the way you write your tests, which means your tests will pass, but they won't detect the bug because the same mental mistake that led to the bug also led to a test that will pass in spite of the bug. So it really is worth your while to set a timer for 90 minutes and brainstorm a bunch of tests before you even get into the code. Then once you've got a set of tests that will really help you get started, you can come in here and add the code you need to your source directory. And next I'll open up a terminal. And then if you've followed the structure I provided, just typing make will compile the program. So I run C4 and well, all it does is says implement me. But the point is it compiles out of the box and does something. Likewise, I can say make student tests and I get an executable called student test and it will run those unit tests. One of them fails, of course, because it's just dummy code in there. To run the system tests, once you've installed RSpec, you just type RSpec. Make sure you do it from the root of the project. Notice you're not in the spec directory. You're one level above the spec directory. But from there, if you type RSpec, it's automatically going to look in the spec directory and run all the tests in there. And of course, they all fail. But they're set up and they can run. So for grins, let's make one of these tests pass. So I'll just change my dummy string here to... All right, so I'll make that change. We'll run make. I'll run the specs again. Before I do that, notice I have four examples. So four tests and four failures. Run our spec. This time, I only have three failures. I got one test to pass. I mean, it, I kind of cheated, but it at least shows you what you're looking for. It's a good idea to periodically commit and push your code to the GitHub repo. That kind of serves as like a backup. Let's say you lose your laptop or your hard drive crashes. It's there, it's safe in the cloud. And it also saves all those versions. So if you decide to try to pull an all-nighter and realize at five o'clock in the morning that your weary, fatigued brain has made a total mess out of your project over the last three hours, you then have a point you can back up to and start again. So I follow the three-step process for pushing code up to GitHub. So I do a git add. That git add dot means to add everything that's new in this directory and anything beneath it which means in this case, the entire project because I'm at the root of the project. And then I do a git commit and give some kind of message. And then I do a git push and that's what sends it up to the cloud. You need to do all three of these steps. And so then when I have done that, I can go back to the GitHub web page. If I refresh that, I now see I have two commits. When you get to the point where you're confident that your code will pass all my tests, and your confidence is actually based on having written your own test, not just on blind optimism, then come over to this Actions tab. So you click on the Actions, come down below where it says All Workflows to Connect for Check. Over here on the right, you'll see where it says Run Workflow, and you'll click the green button that says Run Workflow. Make sure your 
Make sure the branch with your most up-to-date code is highlighted here. And okay, when we click Run Workflow. So that will run the test in the background. Notice it took a few seconds and then this yellow dot came up. That means it's running the test. And it'll take a minute or so to run the test. If this yellow dot hangs out for more than about two or three minutes, it probably means you have an infinite loop in your code. What you want to see is a green check, but if instead what you get is the red X, that almost certainly means that there's a bug in your code, so you're missing a test. There should be an additional test in your code to catch whatever the bug is. On occasion, the failure here won't be caused by a bug in the code, but by a failure in the workflow pipeline somewhere. A server might be down or something like that. So if for some reason you think that the tests aren't running to completion, you can click on the connect for check here and then click on the run instructor tests and you can see the different steps that happen. So you can see, you know, did it in fact compile? So there's, of course, there's no errors here. Was the VM able to install RSpec? It was, you know, these are things you can check out before you actually get to looking at the results of the tests. And of course here, the problem is that the tests failed. Looking at these tests isn't going to help you very much. It's first gonna run your tests, so you can do that locally. There's no point in running the auto tester just to see what your tests turn out to be. If all of your tests pass, then it will run my tests. But I very intentionally gave my test rather obscure names because what I want you to do is rely on your tests. And if I gave the test highly descriptive names, then what happens is students will tend to forget their own tests and then just beat on the auto tester. But that's not what I want you to do. I want you to learn how to test better because that will be really beneficial. Being able to write good tests will make you stand out in the workplace, especially during your first couple of years out of school. Not many recent graduates are very good at testing. So if you're one of the few that are, it should help you move along in your career rather quickly. The other thing is we only have a limited number of minutes in the GitHub cloud. So our budget just doesn't allow for the whole class to be beating on the auto tester. You've really got to put in the time, write some quality tests, and only run the auto tester a few times. So those are the key points. When you do get to that point of having the green check and you've gone through and made sure that your code looks good, is organized well, and have checked off the other non-coding aspects of the project, the way you signal me that you're ready for this to be given a final evaluation is that you include in your commit message the string grade me. You can add other stuff, but when I see that grade me in brackets, it tells me that you're confident you're done and it's time for me to, to look at it with a close eye and offer some feedback. All right, so that should help you get started. Be sure to let me know if you have any trouble. And again, not to belabor the point, please do this in pairs. It is not designed to be a reasonable workload for one person. And there's lots of little things that can go wrong. So having that teammate there built in with his hands in your code will really help the debugging process. There's a big difference between asking somebody who's never seen the code to help you figure out what's going wrong and being able to bounce ideas off of somebody who has the whole, over, who has the complete big picture in his head. All right, happy coding.